Hey everybody, it's Party Lead, and today we're taking a look at a brand new piece of DLC releasing for Crusader Kings 2, Holy Fury. A quick heads up for full disclosure, I was given an early access key from the developers, but as many of you will already know, that makes absolutely no difference as I sink my teeth in. If you're interested in picking the DLC up for yourself, consider using the Humble Bundle affiliate link I've included in the description down below and under the eye at the top right corner of the screen to support the channel and charity as you buy. Without further ado, let's dive in. Is Holy Fury worth our worship, or will it just make us furious? True God protects us. It's a little known fact that Paradox likes to support games for many, many years after release. The base game here is a pretty Eurocentric one, and I'm going to try and isolate the DLC's effects on the core game as best as possible. With that said, many of the effects of the DLC transcend that core game, and I do think that's worth noting as well. So, whether you've only got some of the prior DLC or you've got all of it, this one adds to the experience across the board. Right off the bat, adding a relatively infinite amount of replayability, we've got two new game setup options that include Shattered Worlds and Random Worlds, which are both great ways to see the familiar geographical map get affected by an ever-changing variety of political landscapes. Shattered Worlds lets you see the entire world get broken down into its smallest playable parts. There are no more kings, only counts and, if you so choose, a handful of dukes here and there. This completely changes how the game feels and plays. With the possibility of having everybody on a level playing field, you no longer have to worry about the limitations of being somebody's vassal, and you no longer have to worry about realm-based limitations either. Just you and countless other counties to take. This changes every corner of the map in significant ways, allowing and even forcing you to take completely different courses of actions than you may have in your previous playthroughs. As somebody who personally enjoys starting as a count almost always, I do love this option a lot. There used to be a mod that did this, but it hasn't been supported in almost a year, so it is nice to see it get adopted by the developers. Random worlds, meanwhile, have nations, realms, counties, duchies, kingdoms, and empires all constructed from scratch, sometimes making reference to actual historical empires, I believe. Now, entire hierarchies are implemented, alongside completely fresh religions that you can actually edit if you'd like, using the similar functionality as Pagan Reformation, but I'll touch on that in a moment. A bunch of sliders for both map-making modes allow you to control exactly the kind of random or shattered worlds you'll be playing in, and with both random and shattered worlds, if you hit this button enough times, you can actually play with animal kingdoms. I mean, that's just a genius move. So if you want to uh, be a literal mother of dragons or a rule a kingdom of dogs, have your own duck dynasty, you can. These options are both hilarious and amazing and fun. Functionally, they don't change much beyond, you know, well, <laughs> some hilarity, but it just adds this goofy approach to the game if you're feeling like something fresh. I find sometimes people can get caught up in historical simulation trying to recreate historical events, and this is a nice way to force yourself out of those chains and uh, really make yourself try something new with a rather goofy option, to be perfectly honest. Next up, I do think it's worth talking about personal relationships. In hindsight, my mind is actually quite blown by the fact that this feature wasn't already in the base game, but you can now finally personally sway or antagonize people. This is fantastic for a few reasons. For one, it adds a slew of new options, events, and branching paths. As with many other such events, your character's traits and attributes can change what options are available at any given crossroads, so that means you're likely to see fresh ones for quite a while. Second, it lets you directly influence your relationship with your vassals, your peers, and your superiors in a way that only seems logical. You can meet up for chats, spend time over food and drink, buy gifts of varying costs, bring somebody someone's head if they've been offended by somebody else and you think they'd like to get a head on a plate, I suppose. Either way, you have control over how people perceive you and you can actually directly speak with people and interact with them to influence decisions. As with most things in Crusader Kings though, your decisions will sometimes work as intended and will more often than not crumble in your hands like best laid plans tend to. Ultimately, though not with complete ease, it does let you influence your world directly. 
butter up your liege and get that title you've always wanted, antagonize your brother and goad him into a duel, kill him and, you know, gain the counties he's had or the duchy he's in charge of, uh, gain the adoration of your vassals to prevent rebellions, plots, and disobedience, or just mess about with your personal relationships. That's really a big part of this game, and it's what drew me into Crusader Kings in the first place, and so I'm really glad to see it get developed over time. It just gets more and more interesting with more options, and this is a very welcome addition. It's also an improvement that affects everybody across the playable world, so it is the broadest stroke that this DLC could bring. And like I said, in hindsight, I'm actually surprised that it wasn't already part of the game, a truly colossal addition. The only annoyance here is that you can't antagonize multiple people at once. I figure that there's probably a balancing act somewhere here, but if I'm able to sway multiple people at once, surely I should be able to make fun of multiple people's mothers at the same time as well. Moving on, we see legendary bloodlines being introduced as a mechanic that can apply across the board. Many characters that you can play as are already part of a legendary bloodline from the start, whereas others can forge their own in a multitude of ways. Whether this is by restoring a kingdom to its former glory, forming a nation of particular note, personally killing hundreds, becoming particularly prestigious, and probably several other ways that are still a mystery. The bloodline is inherited much like everything else, passing down from generation to generation, potentially mixing with other bloodlines to make one super bloodline. And these bloodlines are more than just bragging rights, they bring with them various modifiers that might influence how you approach your playthrough. I do wish more legendary bloodlines existed across the map, but I have to give kudos that legendary bloodlines are not just restricted to the Eurocentric world, they're not just restricted to right around the Mediterranean. We see stuff in Europe, we see stuff in the Middle East, we see you know, Genghis Khan, we see Attila's bloodline, so it's nice to see that we weren't limited in this DLC, only to have more added later. With that said, it'd be nice to see a couple more, though I suppose if there are too many legendary bloodlines on the map, they stop feeling so legendary. Now, parallel to legendary bloodlines, though limited to Christendom, is sainthood. Particularly pious people can get canonized for their good deeds, and this can be passed on between generations as well. Being the descendant of a saint is, of course, worth something. And yes, you can have both a legendary bloodline as well as a saint in your ancestry. These are both really nice additions that give you more to chase after if you are so inclined. It'd be pretty interesting to see bloodline status and sainthood get revoked or replaced. Imagine being the grandson of some mad murderer only to have one day arrive at attorney that your liege is organizing to find out that somebody else has outdone your grandfather. And now, and now you're no longer considered so legendary anymore. Or, you know, maybe your bloodline is considered worse because each son or daughter didn't outdo their parents. It would add another layer of rivalry and loathing between characters, and it would force you to try and maintain ownership of certain claims to fame, such as your legendary bloodline. I feel like that'd be a nice addition to see uh, on top of what is already a pretty cool mechanic and a nice way to, again, respect and note player actions and have them mean something over a longer period of time. Now, Christendom is actually getting a lot of cool new features and upgrades. That's the Holy in the Holy Fury. Uh, baptisms can be performed to gain a special trait, and the baptism can either be done by a local bishop or one of more importance. Maybe the Pope will show up for the right amount of money and piety. Similarly, coronation ceremonies are important, formally recognizing a new king or emperor in the eyes of God through a bishop or perhaps, again, the Pope. These reflect the importance of religion and religiousness in the time period quite well. We're also seeing the Crusades, and this is the Fury part of the Holy Fury, <laughs> they're getting a well-deserved facelift, and it really does give them much more weight and a sense of gravity that I always felt they were missing. There's a whole preparation phase during which you can see just how many people are planning on getting involved on both sides. You can help build the war chest if you can afford it, you can also influence the direction the crusade will take, and you can outright change the target if you're pious enough. So rather than the crusade in the Middle East, you can say, hey, I actually need help on the Iberian Peninsula, and if you're pious enough, you can turn the direction of the crusade, which I think is pretty interesting. And skipping out on a crusade will actually see you punished. You'll either take a small hit to piety or perhaps outright excommunication. The latter is, of course, a serious concern. The war chest, which again, you can contribute to, is used to actually fund the Crusades and also to spread around rewards if the Crusade is won. In the case of failure, however, all of Christendom takes a severe fiscal loss, at least everybody who was involved in the Crusade. Now, when the Crusade ends, things stay juicy, especially if it's been won. The Pope can either elect a primary recipient of the spoils when he calls for the Crusade, 
or it can be left to the primary contributor, the greatest contributor, forcing you to actually get involved to gain something. The recipient can also take a stance as to how they want the spoils to be treated. Either they can take it for themselves and be greedy, they can take it for their beneficiary, or they can let the Pope decide what happens, which is of course the answer the Pope wants to see. There are also the Northern Crusades and the Reconquista to consider, they're being introduced as well, so that's nice to see. They're all important parts of history. We get the Children's Crusade as well, and there are a lot of options you can actually turn on and off when you start a new game. Between all this and many more small additions, playing as a Christian is going to feel very fresh and new in many ways. There's so many new goals to try and hit, there's so many new ways to get involved, and there's just so much more weight to faith. On the flip side, pagans are seeing some serious reworking as well. For one, you can now play as pagans even if you don't have the old gods DLC. So, in some ways, this includes the benefits of a prior DLC, though it doesn't come with the earlier start date. Reforming a pagan faith is a much more interesting experience now. After you meet the requirements of controlling the holy sites and having a certain level of piety, you get to tailor your faith to suit your playstyle, and the choices you make can completely change how a playthrough feels. Of course, there is a limited number of options, but the combinations are seemingly endless. You can have one game with a rather inert and peaceful faith, and another in the same part of the world with a bloodthirsty, violent religion that demands human sacrifice. Follow the zodiac and use the stars to guide you, or be driven by predictions in the entrails of animals. <laughs> There's a great deal of variety here, and exploring the combinations of elements should result in some fun in and of itself. Who knows what hidden combinations come together for strange decisions and convoluted event chains and decisions? Can my chief spend his waning years seeking answers in the guts of imprisoned enemies? Meanwhile, we've got a brand new society type for pagans as well, warrior lodges. Now, for all intents and purposes, these lodges are just, dare I say, a reskin of other societies. That's not to say they're not cool, they bring their own events and options, but I would almost stray away from calling it a brand new mechanic or feature. Arguably, this is more of a monks and mystics feature. It comes with some nice visual indicators, including tattoos, face paints, furs, and the like, and it also has some interesting mission types that typically involve some form of, of course, warrior-like behavior or, you know, dueling for honor, dueling to the death, going to war, inducting your child. There's a variety of missions that let you move up the ranks and unlock more interesting abilities that you can perform, and they are, I would say, grounded in reality. You're not about to summon a demon unlike other societies that have been made available in the recent past. No, this is a lot more realistic to being a member of a warrior lodge. A cool addition, but again, almost wonder if this shouldn't have been brought in with monks and mystics. When it comes to making an overall judgment call, I'm not a fan of numerical scores, as they feel rather arbitrary and they lead to comparisons that don't necessarily make sense. Instead, I think the best way to judge something like this is based on how much entertainment it provides at the cost. If it sounds like there are some big changes coming with this DLC, it's because there are. Whether you're just on the base game or you've got all the prior DLC, you're going to see some interesting new mechanics across the map. And if you're playing as a Christian or as the Pagans, you're going to get maximum benefit out of the DLC. One way or another, we are seeing a slew of new mechanics and improvements to old systems that bring new life to the game, and in some cases, new life to where things felt a little abandoned over the last handful of years. I haven't felt this interested in going on a crusade in a very long time, in the game, I mean. And the kill lists and Pagan Reformation add a very nice personal touch to every playthrough. I especially love the new personal relationships mechanics, and the plethora of events and choices born out of all the new additions means that there are countless hours of fun to be had. I like a good role-playing session a lot. That is my primary draw into Crusader Kings 2, and if it's yours as well, I think that this one is a must-buy right from the start. Even if you're a newcomer to Crusader Kings 2 and you have a little checklist of which DLC you should begin the game with, don't start your first game without Holy Fury. The features and elements that I spoke of in this review are just a fraction of all the features and elements being added to the game. There really is too much to talk about on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, so I hope this gives you a good general impression of my thoughts across the board with some of the bigger chunks that I feel like are a bigger contributing factor to the price point of the DLC that might seem a little steep until you realize just how much of a change the DLC is bringing to the game. I hope you enjoyed this review of Holy Fury, and I hope you found it informative. 
For more strategy gaming coverage, including reviews, let's plays, and previews, make sure you subscribe to this channel. After all, Deus Volt. A massive thanks as always to channel members and patrons for supporting on a monthly basis, and a big thanks to you for watching. Till next time, cheers.